I thank you. I apologize. I was uh, distracted. I was, I'll tell you what I was doing. I was uh, text screaming at my son for getting a parking ticket at school in, uh, in Gainesville, Florida, in case you're watching at the University of Florida. Um, Anyway, um, thank you for, thanks, first of all, thanks for writing this and, and, and for the work uh, you've done in this field. Uh, maybe I'll just come from my perspective, because I really think you touched on something. I was actually on a uh, video conference today with some state legislators from, from Georgia, and they asked about the, you know, tech companies and what the federal government could do and how we could this, uh, and it struck me, and I said to them what I had said to other people, and it sort of, here's the example. I have, there's one, and I, this, I think this is true in all the country, there's generally one power company no matter where you live. It's a utility, and they are allowed to operate in basically a monopoly space. They are guaranteed a profit, but their profits are limited, and they get to, so in Florida, the way it works is you go to this public service commission and you say, this is how much it costs to generate power, this is how much I have to charge people in order to make my statutorily protected profit, but they control how much money you make, but they are a monopoly. So imagine if the electric company decides one day, I am not going to provide electricity for people who believe this, or people who are in this line of work, or people who are in this line of business. Well, it'd be pretty dramatic uh, if they were able to do that. And maybe I, maybe I shouldn't speak this into the public square, because maybe tomorrow someone will get some bright idea about what electric companies and utilities should be doing to people. We're really not that far off in many spaces. It strikes me tomorrow there's going to be this artificial intelligence um, meeting in the Senate where many, apparently, many of these prominent, Mark Zuckerberg is supposed to be there, so is Elon Musk, so I think we may actually have a fight as well, uh, <laughs> coordinated as part of this thing, you know, the whole thing they're supposed to, this fight they're supposed to have or whatever. And it struck me, if you think about it, and this is nothing personal against them per se, but I would argue that in a room with maybe up to 100 United States senators, the two most powerful people in that room will not be members elected by the public, but two heads of important companies, one in particular with Meta. And, you know, and it's not because of wealth, it's because they control what is in essence a utility in the 21st century. If today four or five companies, if Amazon, Google, Apple, you know, Meta, I'll throw, what is it called now, X, um, all get together, but let's say the first four, maybe the first five get together and decide, you know what we're gonna do? We're going to destroy so-and-so, business or individual, could they not really do that? Could they not deny just about anybody uh, a space in the public square, destroy your business so they refuse to uh, provide you services? It would be very difficult. This is an extraordinary amount of power in the hands of the private sector. And it can be used for what people presume to be noble reasons and so forth, but it can also be used under tremendous public pressure uh, to target political opponents, to target those who fall out of line, to target those who they may not agree with. That is in many, and it can be used to threaten you. It can be, how many people out there today are not afraid to openly and express their views on a topic or take a public position on either side of a debate, uh, although it seems to be disproportionately on one side of most debates, because they are afraid of the impact they could have on them, not just reputationally, but in many ways uh, economically. And, and I think that's what you sort of touch upon. We, have, we are not built to think of the, public, of the private square, of private companies as holding that amount of power over individuals, but that's how consolidated that those industries have become. And where that sort of leads is an area that I've spent most of my time, not so much, I mean, obviously I've touched on some of the things that you've written about and talked about here today, but primarily really what is this a product of? And, and it really kind of almost tracks pretty well with my adult life. I graduated in high school, and I say graduated as a term of art from high school in 1989, I was not a good student. In fact, I did not become a good student until I started paying for it, or shall I say borrowing for it. And um, then I started caring a lot more about school and things of that nature. But um, I graduated in high school in 89. I'm a you know, graduate from the University of Florida in 93. So just did the world change between 89 and 93? It changed quite dramatically. I grew up in an era, I vividly recall, you know, growing up where like, remember the movie The Day After where the world was supposed to end in this nuclear attack? Remember war games where Matthew Broderick hacked into the Pentagon and started a war game that almost ended the world. So I grew up in that world, right? It was the United States versus the Soviet Union, good versus evil, Reagan versus these devils. And, that, and, that, and then it all just sort of fell apart, not literally, like the Berlin Wall collapses. And I remember, even though I was in college, and I will admit it was not like the predominant thing of, in, on my mind at that time, I was aware of it, and I knew it was a pretty big deal. And, and, I, and I thought about that, and, but the rest of the world did too. 
And we emerged from that with two things. First of all, a real level of hubris, of, of a feeling that we won. We, free enterprise, democracy, had won. And communism and Marxism had been defeated. And so naturally, the war was over, this Cold War. And now everyone was going to become a free enterprise economy. And everyone was going to become a democracy. And you may say to yourself, well, you know, that, that was a noble endeavor. And that was certainly something we should have aspired to. There's nothing. But we made decisions on a presumption that was flawed, a couple of presumptions. The first is that now somehow a global economy and global economic commerce would replace the nation state. There was a saying, and I don't know who to attribute it to, but I, but I know it was out there because I heard it at the time and many years later, never have two countries with McDonald's ever gone to war with each other. Well, that obviously sounds silly, but it was widely, am I right? That, that I don't care, if fact, what does it matter anymore these fact checkers say, but I'm sure it was really said uh, because I've heard it. And if it there you go, exactly. I don't know who to attribute it to, so, and I imagine multiple people take credit for it, I guess. The point being is that this idea that somehow inner commerce now between nation states or between people would now replace nation states, that no longer would it matter. National interests were no longer really as relevant because we really couldn't fight with each other and it would all be worked out that way. The second assumption that was made is that now that the world was sort of at this utopia that we had reached, not only would the co global commerce replace nation state and the national interest as a result, but in fact that we were really nothing more at this point, not citizens of a country or members of a community or what ha or we were now all either investors and or consumers in a global marketplace. The third assumption that was made is as a result of all this, the natural order of things should be that the market outcome would always deliver the most efficient outcome, which is 100% true. If the market is allowed to work, it will deliver the most efficient outcome. And that would drive investment. And so who cares if the factory in your town or the employer that had been the anchor of a community for 30 years closed down because it was now cheaper to do what you used to do somewhere else, not just because of automation, by the way, but because of cheaper labor, who cares? It's going to go over there. That means lower prices, right? You'll not go to the store. You'll pay a lot less for whatever it is they made there, even though it's made halfway around the world and they have to ship it back to you. But here's the great news. A better job is coming. It will replace the job that was wiped out. It'll actually pay you more. You'll be happier. And that was another assumption that was made in this laboratory. But we all know that's not how it worked out. And what we've learned, and I say all this to you guys, by the way, as someone basically raised and, you know, grew up in the ranks of the free enterprise orthodoxy of the Republican Party and of the center right. And one of the reasons why is because the people on the other side of this debate were either socialists or communists or a combination thereof. And I felt like those people are wrong. They're crazy. These things are really bad for the world. And so I'm the opposite of whatever that is. And that was the only opposite that was offered. And so these assumptions sort of guided public policy and in some ways built a consensus. So that's why you get to 2001 and it's like, sure, let's let China uh, join the World Trade Organization. Yeah, let them in. Because don't worry, yeah, they're going to cheat. Yes, they're going to steal jobs from us, but they're going to get rich. And when they get rich, they'll become just like us and they'll stop cheating. Another pretty stupid gamble, but that was the notion. Why were these things wrong? The assumptions were wrong for a couple of reasons. The first is nation state will always matter because the most essential, the most, you know, human nature will never change. 5,500 years of recorded history teaches us that. And that's why history repeats itself. Now, we change the way we live. We change the way we dress. We change the way we speak. We change all kinds of things. But human nature will never change. And one of the core elements of human nature is this desire to belong. And that's why anywhere in the world that you put people together, two people, 10 people, they immediately want to join something and band together to do something. It's just a natural thing. And one of those things in the modern era, and I mean the modern era in the last three, 400 years, is the rise of nation states. Place and belonging matter. So that's the first reason why it was wrong. Now, the idea that we had that that would no longer matter, we would all now be citizens of the global economy, citizens of the world, we would, you know, it wouldn't matter anymore. You know, that was a fantasy that people adopted that who could afford to adopt it, who had passports and could travel all over the world and went to all these forums. But for most people in America, that was never true. But it was especially not true for the leaders of China and Russia and other countries who said, no, we're gonna stay with nation state interests, thank you very much. We're going to still continue to focus on the nation state. But the other error that was made was about the jobs. And it, the mistake that was made there was the belief that jobs was simply like the place that provides you a paycheck. And jobs are a lot more than just about a paycheck. First, a paycheck really matters. But a job is not a jo just a job. 
There are jobs and then there are stable jobs. There are jobs and then there are uh, reliable jobs. There are jobs and then there are jobs that you can actually raise a family on. And our economic numbers don't mention that. It almost, I always sort of like think to myself, every time I hear the monthly report, 100,000 new jobs created, what they don't tell you is, well, what kind of jobs? Are these jobs that are gonna be around in six months? Do these jobs pay enough? Do they pay at least forty or fifty thousand dollars at a minimum, so you could afford to—I don't know—you know, raise a family, be a member of a community? Well, they be, can you rely on that job existing three or four years from now, so you can actually become a member of a community? Um, so that's the first thing they don't tell you. The second thing they don't tell you is about underemployment. What about—I don't know what the percentage is up to now—30, 35 percent of people that have these degrees and can't find a job in the degree they got, and they borrowed money for that degree, but now they can't find a job. Are these the kinds of jobs that, and the other point is, so when you, t when you yank jobs away from people, you don't just rob them of their dignity and their purpose, you actually, it has a corrosive effect on family formation and on community. Because if you think about a community, the anchor of a community is those stable, reliable jobs. Because unless you have stable, reliable jobs, you don't have coaches for the Little League. You don't have presidents for the PTA. You don't have the civic organizations that actually hold the country together. One of the notions that was lost in this era was that America is not an economy. America is not a government. America is a nation. And the glue, the fiber of a nation is not the government. The government is, is what you know, creates laws and sort of protects us and does all sorts of things. But, but it's not the country. And it's not an economy. We have an economy. We need an economy. But our, our country, the fiber and the basic elements of a country are families and community the two most important institutions in any society. And I don't care how wealthy you are, how much your GDP grows, how geopolitically influential your government may be. If you don't have family and community and they are not strong, your country will not be strong. It will be weak and it will be divided. And those are the economic implications that that's had. And so the struggle now for people and sort of a realization that I, as I said, look, I don't think there's anything wrong with learning and then adapting what you learn to the, what's before you. And beginning in about 2014, 2015, certainly by 2016, part of that happens to be on the presidential trail while I'm on there, is I start to encounter number one is, if America's doing so well, why is everybody so pissed off at each other and at the world in general? And there's a lot of that. And it was shocking to me, because I'm a product of the American dream. My mom was a stock clerk at Kmart. It's the last job she had. My dad was a banquet bartender, and they owned a home. And they retired with dignity. And they left all four of their kids better off. And I'm in the US Senate running for president. I'm like, this is a great country. Why isn't everybody as happy about it? And then you encounter people that say, well, you know, because I worked in this place for 30 years and my dad before me, and one day they got, first they cut my pay, and then they just got up and left. And now what do I do? Now I, I can't find a job that replaces that one. And they tell me, why don't you learn how to code and move to San Francisco? Well, and this was back in 2016 when people still lived in San Francisco. And, um, <laughs> and they said, uh, and said, I'm not gonna, you know, how, it doesn't work for me. It completely disconnects them. And, um, and, and so it, can, it disconnects them from community and family, from all the things that make life worth living and the, and the implications that that had. So we lost that perspective. And, and the challenge then became, I, 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 despise, I think socialism is a failure everywhere it's been tried. If you look at the southern border of the United States, a substantial percentage of the people there come from socialist countries called Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. It's failed everywhere. Communism has failed. Marxism has failed everywhere. So I believe in the market. You know why I believe in the market? I believe in market and capitalism because it is the one economic model capable of creating not just prosperity, but widespread prosperity that allows you to build societies anchored in family and in community. Where not everyone's going to be a billionaire or even a millionaire, but you're going to produce the largest number of good paying jobs for as many people as possible. But only if you make that a priority, only if that becomes part of the equation when you make public policy decisions. And so when you make public policy decisions under the assumption that, will this policy generate economic growth and wealth? And that's important. You can't have good, stable, good paying jobs without wealth creation and economic success at the corporate level. You need that. But you can't just have that alone. It has to be the kind of growth that creates wealth and prosperity, but also creates good paying jobs for as many people as possible, Americans in our case. And that's the perspective that was lost. It didn't matter where the wealth was being created. It didn't matter where the wealth was being concentrated. It didn't matter if the wealth was the product of jobs created somewhere else. What mattered was whether some company with an address in the United States, although American in no other way, in terms of how they viewed themselves, um, did well when the bell rang at the end of the day in the stock market. And that was a perspective we lost. And here's the other quandary that you reached. 
the market, and I believe in the market, but the market, it's a tool. It exists to serve the national interest, not the national interest and not our people to serve the market. And where it really gets complicated is when the most efficient outcome is not good for your country. And there are people that will still argue with you to this day, that's impossible, that never happens. It most certainly does. The market says it's more efficient to buy 88% of the active ingredients in our pharmaceuticals in China because they subsidize it, because they steal, because they have lower labor, whatever it may be. Is it in our national interest to depend on a foreign competitor slash adversary for 88% of the active ingredients in our pharmaceutical or to corner 80% of the rare earth minerals on earth or any of these other industrial capabilities? What about during COVID where everybody's freaking out because we couldn't make masks and we couldn't make this and now, you know, maybe we didn't need that many masks, I suppose, but maybe, you know, at the time and all these panic that was going on about this. Because we real, for the first time, we came face to face with deindustrialization and the national interest component of it. And it's easy to talk about deindustrialization simply from, wouldn't it be great if we had more factories because it feels like the good old days? I'm not talking about going back to the 50s. What I'm saying to you is that that lack of industrial capacity has a national security component to it, a national economic security, but it also has a job component. I published a, a, a report a week ago, talked about the, the, the standing of men in the workplace. And in particular, what I would focus on are men without college degrees. Why are men without college degrees struggling in the 21st century to find jobs? Because the jobs that largely supported them were industrial type jobs, and they have vanished as well. And we can go on and on, but the point is that we've come to a point where this realization is before us. And the two choices are not, A, the market's always right, do whatever, let's worship the market, whatever outcome it reaches, that's the right one, or B, let the government take over the means of production and pour a bunch of government money into every endeavor that has an American flag sticker on the door. Those are two false choices. But we have to return to an era in which we understand the proper role of the market and it exists to serve the nation, and that requires us to re-embrace the concept of the national interests at every level. And we should not be, a, that does not make you a, you know, nationalist is a word that's turned, ter, th thrown around these days as is to say, I don't care about what's happening in the rest of the world or all I only care about America. I don't only care about America, but I do care about America before anything else, not because I'm inhumane, but because of an American elected official does not put the American national interest as the first topic of thought behind any decision. Well, who is the Bolivian Senate? The Senate of, you know, I don't know, some Lithuania? Who is supposed to put the American national interest first? If you want to think about the corporate setting where they always argue our job is to protect our shareholders, my job is to protect my shareholders, which happen to be the men and women of the United States of America and the families of this country. And so I don't think there's anything wrong in saying, number one, we need to make the national interest the number one objective, the number one criteria we apply to any public policy decision at the federal level. Number two, that it is in the national interest to have an economy that empowers workers to have dignified and stable work so they can build families and communities. And number three, that should extend to our engagements around the world. There are things, there are a lot of terrible things that happen in the world, and if we can help, we, and we, we should. But number one, before we decide how we get involved and how much we get involved, what is the core national interest of the United States? That's more true today than ever. We are no longer the world's sole superpower. You're, this is no longer a unipolar world where we have the luxury of playing in every uh, conflict or in everything that's going on around the world. We can care about all of them. We can try to help where we can. But by and large, we do have to now pick our fights more than ever. Because as great and as powerful as this country is, it does not have unlimited power. It does not have unlimited reach and it does not have unlimited resources. And it has to prioritize them in a new geopolitical era. I'll close with one last observation. I've talked about the AI thing. And it's interesting because I am a firm believer that you basically cannot hold back technological advance, no matter how hard you try. Technological advances are gonna happen and everybody's freaking out about artificial intelligence. And there are a couple points that I have about the primarily like, is artificial intelligence going to become something that, and there's a lot, nobody knows the answer to this, okay? But is it gonna be a technology that makes humans do what humans do better, faster, more accurately? Or is it gonna be a technology that replaces humans? I mean, completely. Is it gonna be automation that actually allowed one worker to do the work of five? Or is it going to be something that actually takes the human element out completely? We don't know the answer to that. But what strikes me about it is there's a lot more freaking out going on about AI right now, which is not yet really on top of us in the levels that it could be, much more than there was about automation. 
some of the same people said, don't worry about automation, that's going to be good. Because yeah, there'll be less workers, but the workers will make more money. Or don't worry about deindustrialization because we're all going to be software engineers and we're all going to make a lot of money. Don't worry about that. But now those same people are freaking out. You know why? Because for the first time, we have a massive, disruptive technological advance that threatens not the blue-collar worker, not the $40,000 a year worker. It threatens the people that are making a lot of money and suddenly realizing they may not need me anymore. I mean, one of the cornerstones of the Hollywood strike is Screenwriters that don't want to be replaced by a machine and actors that don't want to be replaced by a fake avatar or whatever it is that's going to replace them. So you think about it. Now we are seeing a disruption that impacts white collar, higher educated or higher uh, standard of living workers. And all of a sudden now they are freaked out about some revolutionary change going on in society. But that interest did not exist when it came to the American worker. And whether it was out of malice, out of greed or out of stupidity, when we decided that we were no longer a country that needed to make things and create jobs that can employ as many Americans as possible in a stable way, we did real damage to the country and the national fiber. And, it's, and the reason why I know this is true is because it's not just happening to us. Virtually every industrialized country in the world, particularly in the West, is going through similar domestic upheavals, whether it's immigration or, or uh, the state of their economy or government policies on, on climate and the like because they're all feeling the exact same thing. These decisions and these assumptions that have led this world and our country for 30 years were a mistake. And now we have to confront that mistake and hopefully reverse it. And it's my personal hope, although I think you're a little bit more pessimistic than I am, that the Republican Party will be the home of that movement. But it won't be easy because there are a lot of roots, deep roots that go into everything from you know, the uh, intellectual world that lead public policy to much of the traditional center-right uh, institutions. But there's change. We've made a lot of progress in four or five years. We have a lot more, more work to do. And I thank you for the invitation to talk about it, because I do think what you discuss about tyranny is a byproduct of economic decisions that actually empower the centralization, uh, vertical integration of, um, of certain industries that have extraordinary power at a time when we all felt, as long as it's the private sector, don't worry about it, because there'll be a competitor out there that will regulate how they behave. There is no competitor for Amazon. There is no competitor for Google. There really isn't. And, um, and so I, now we, we reap what we sowed. So anyway, thank you for the chance to talk to you about all this. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.